morning's scripture reading will be from the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. A ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you possess and distribute it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, The things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Peter said, Behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. Turn your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 18. We continue in that great chapter of Luke's gospel. This morning, I want to go back uh, one more time and look at the passage that was read. We talked about that passage last week, the scene of the rich young ruler running up to Jesus. You remember that from last week? I want to go back to that scene this morning. Remind you of this. In Luke 18, we have been looking at three scenes that answer the question, what does saving faith look like? What is the faith required to get me into the kingdom of heaven? You see, that has been the theme of this section. Jesus has been talking about the kingdom of heaven, and then he asked the question in verse 8 of Luke chapter 18, will he find faith on the earth? And so the question is, what does that faith look like? And then what he does is he gives us three scenes of faith expressed. The first scene was the Pharisee and the tax collector that went into the temple to pray. Only one came out justified. Why? Because his faith was demonstrated by a repentance. His faith was demonstrated by the acknowledgement that he is a sinner, unworthy to stand before a holy God. The second picture of faith was found in verses 15 through 17 with the children. Remember the children? Don't hinder the children. Let them come to me. What was he saying? You must become like a child. You must become like a child to come into the kingdom of heaven. So your faith, your faith needs to be like the faith of a child. You need to recognize that you don't have a resume to depend on. Children don't have anything to depend on. They've done nothing. And that's what it is to go into the kingdom of heaven, recognizing I can do nothing to make myself worthy before a holy God. Dependency, a dependent faith. I'm totally dependent on God. See, folks, these are the attitudes that are behind true saving faith. And then last week, we looked at this rich young ruler and in the eyes of the world, in the eyes of all his friends, this guy was very successful. This guy was very prominent. This guy was very rich. This guy was very religious. He was a leader in the synagogue. He comes to Jesus with the question of all questions. He says, how might I inherit eternal life? Listen, that's the kind of question you want somebody to ask you, isn't it? You would think, Jesus, why don't you just tell him to believe in you? Believe in you. Why don't you give him that answer? Jesus doesn't even mention faith in that passage. And he says to him, you know, this man is coming to him because he feels, I'm very religious, but I don't feel connected to God. I'm very religious, but I feel distant from God. I'm very religious, but I don't believe I'm in the kingdom of God. How can I inherit eternal life? How can I have the life that is connected to God? I do all of these things, and I'm very wealthy, 
and I feel so far from God. I want to be connected to God. And Jesus wants you to tell him, believe in you. It's like I told you last week, because there's other issues here that Jesus reveals about this man's heart. Jesus is not interested in somebody making some expression of faith that's not connected to turning away from your idols. You see, this man is like a lot of people. They want Jesus plus something else. They want other gods before them. They want to not love the Lord their God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This man loved his money. It's almost like some people want eternal life because they don't want the option of hell. They want eternal life so bad, they will, sing, they will pray a prayer because they think that's the formula to get eternal life. And the problem is Jesus is not interested in superficial faith. He's not interested in a faith that is temporary, that's based on emotion and built on, just based on felt needs. He is interested in a faith that loves him with their whole heart and mind, a faith that wants not just eternal life, but wants Jesus at the same time. You see that? A lot of people want eternal life, but they don't want Jesus. Because they don't want hell, but they don't want Jesus. They don't want to surrender their lives to Jesus. They don't want to bow down to Jesus. I want to still bow down to my wealth. And this guy left. This guy left. Jesus says, you're really a bad evangelist, Jesus. I mean, the guy was right there asking the right question, and you let the fish get off the hook. Friends, listen, that is, that is because... Another picture of true saving faith is it's a faith, it's a faith that loves God with all your heart, soul, and mind. I'm willing to let go of my idols. I'm willing. See, I told you last week, this man had the rocky soil, the rocky soil. That's the soil that has a little bit of interest, but then there's a bedrock that's down there. And the, it, and the gospel never takes root, root in that kind of heart. What happens is, because of a, that bedrock represents other loves, and it goes down a little ways, and the springs up for a little while, but it eventually hits that bedrock, and it dies. It withers. Persecution comes, or something comes, and other interests come. It's, it, it's no longer there anymore. Jesus doesn't, just, Jesus doesn't simply say to this man, just believe in me. And that's, that'll give you eternal life because he knew there were other issues in his heart. You and I would have had the guy signing a card and walking an aisle with this kind of interest. But so we have to understand that men's hearts, men's hearts are, you know, people go in a lot of felt need. And I believe his felt needs were real. And I believe people have a lot of real felt needs out there, real pain and real hurts. But all they really want is, God, give me a better marriage. God, give me more money. God, give me better kids. God, give me this. God, give me that. But they don't want Jesus. They really don't want Jesus. He says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to follow me, 923, follow me, deny yourself, deny yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus seems to always be putting barriers up. Always seems to be putting barriers up. This is just interesting. He, he reveals the heart of the person he's speaking to. Incredible statements are coming up. Now, this is what I want to focus on this morning. Verses 24 through 27. Jesus, when this man, this man walked away because he's wealthy, and Jesus just got through telling him, sell everything you got. You and I know you don't go to heaven by selling everything you got. That's not the issue there. It is the issue of this man's heart. It reveals that he loves his money more than God. But the man went away. And Jesus makes this statement, and this is pretty incredible, and this is where we're going to spend our time for a little bit this morning. Verse 24, And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And then he says this statement, For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it, his disciples say, whoa, then who can be saved? He says, the things that are impossible with people 
are possible with God. You know, should think about these verses with me this morning. How hard is it for wealthy people to enter the kingdom of God? That's what he's saying. People taught in Jesus' time that if you were wealthy, you were certainly in the kingdom of God. God's blessing you. God's giving you all kinds of prosperity. In the eyes of people, that's why they're, they're shocked when this man walks up to Jesus and asks that question. Because he's a rich man. He's in the kingdom. This man knows he's not in the kingdom. And Jesus says, it's hard for a rich man. And certainly we can understand because of his idols, because of those things he's just said. He worships his money more than God, loves his money more than God. We can understand all of that. Jesus is using that to set up this next point. How hard, Jesus, is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Exactly how hard is it? Verse 25. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You know what that statement is saying? Not only is it hard, it is impossible. It is impossible. That's a proverbial saying, okay? And that's what the saying meant. It was a common saying in parts of the Middle East, sometimes they would insert the word elephant going through the eye of a needle. It's according to where you lived. But it was a common proverb. The biggest animal in Israel was a camel. The biggest animal in other parts of the Middle East was an elephant. So whatever the biggest animal is, all you're talking is in, in exaggeration. But you're speak of it, speaking of impossibility here. It's impossible. Not only is it hard, he is saying, it is impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And a lot of people struggle with this statement. And you say, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Impossible for a rich man to be saved? Rod, I know rich people that are saved. I know rich people that are wealthy. Excuse me, that are saved. Wealthy people that are saved. <laughs> I know rich people that are saved. How can that be? Surely, surely verse 25 means something else than impossible for a rich man to be saved. There are some people that have taken this to try and leave the door open for possibility. To leave the door open for possibility, they have gone and said things like this. They have said, Number one, they have said, since the word for camel, in verse 25, is so close to the word cord or thread in the Greek, spelled so closely alike, surely they meant to write thread here and not camel. It's difficult but possible. You and I, I might have a hard time with it, getting a thread through the eye of a needle, but it can be done, but it's hard. So surely, surely, they wrote the wrong word here. What are they trying to do? They're trying to get rid of the impossibility. Follow me? Secondly, here's another one. But, but oh, what I will say to you on that, to answer that, is it's proverbial. Remember that. It was something that was spoken very commonly in this culture to speak of the impossibility of something. Thirdly, or secondly, others have suggested no, he's talking about the needle gate to Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. A camel going through that small gate and very squeezing its way through that small gate. Problem is, there's no such gate. There's no such gate. Some people have just liked to come up with, have come up with that one, though, and I used to hear that one all the time. Oh, there's a needle gate, and this is a hard gate for a camel to get through. Once again, leaving the possibility of a rich man entering into the kingdom of heaven. And the third one, and this is the wildest of all, and this is the one that says you reduce the camel to molecules and to a liquid, you could eye drop him through the eye of a needle. That's actually in a commentary. 
But see, none of those are the point. It's not possible. That's what he's saying. Jesus is saying it's not possible. If you take the parallel passage in Mark chapter 10, 23, it says basically some of the very same things here, but it does add something that helps us a little bit with our understanding of this. Jesus, um, talking about the wealthy, and it says they were amazed at his wealthy not being able to enter the kingdom of heaven. They, they, they talk, uh, Jesus says to them, That statement, they looked at Jesus amazed because they just assumed wealthy people got into heaven. The rabbis taught they could even buy their way into heaven by paying alms. And then Jesus in Mark 24 says, children, children. He switches it from just rich people to everybody. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of heaven. So he makes it a general statement. And he uses the camel and the needle proverb there as well. The point I'm making with that is this. It's not just hard or impossible for rich men. It's hard and impossible for everyone. That's what he's saying. It's impossible for everyone to enter the kingdom of heaven. Interesting. We have just gotten through looking at three illustrations in Luke 18 of what true faith, true saving faith looks like. And may I suggest to you that that is the human side of faith that we have been looking at. The human side of faith. And what Jesus is referring to here is the divine side of salvation. The human side of salvation is your faith must look like this. The divine side says you can't do it. That rich man cannot change himself. That rich man cannot get rid of his idols himself. That rich man can't love God with all his heart, soul, and mind himself. I can't abandon my self-righteousness myself. I can come to Jesus and feel depressed and sad. I can come to Jesus feeling empty and lonely. I can come to Jesus and saying, I hope he would and hope he would fix my life and make my life all better. I can come to Jesus like that, and a lot of people do. I can come to Jesus and cry out to him to, to give me a better family and a better this and a better that. Take away my depression, do all of that. Make me happy so I don't fear death. I can feel all of that, but the one thing I cannot do, friends, is I cannot, I cannot abandon my own sinful nature and heart. I cannot do that. It can bother me that it's like this, but I can't get rid of, I cannot get rid, 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 excuse me, rid of the imaginations of my heart that are evil continually. Like Jeremiah 12, 13 says, the Ethiopian cannot change his skin, the leopard cannot change his spots, then we can't, he says we can't change ourselves either. Nobody can change themselves. Nobody. I don't have the power to transform myself. So everybody's in this situation. And it's shocking, shocking stuff here because this is a works righteousness system he's talking to and he's saying it's impossible. It's impossible. Who, excuse me, you can't get there on your own. What he's saying, it's impossible. You can't get a camel through a needle. To try and do it is try to get a camel through a needle and you can't do it. Then then who can be saved? That's your question. You see that in in, in Luke uh, 18? Then who can be saved? There's frustration. Then who can be saved? If nobody can, if it's impossible, then who can? Who can? Who can? 
He says, it's, what's impossible with men is possible with God. God can do it. God can do it. Only God can change the heart. I, what I'm showing you this morning is the sovereign work of God in salvation. That's what I'm going to show you this morning. Before you can respond to God, God must do something in you. Before you can respond to God in faith and repentance and with the heart attitude of a child and dependency and not trusting in your resume and turning loose of your idols, before you can do any of that, God must do something in you. That is God's sovereign, saving work. And only God can do that. You cannot do that. Nobody in this room can do that. God must do something first. Something must precede that. Something must precede your faith and trust. That's my point this morning. That's where I'm going with this. I told you this once before. I told you when I was in college, there was a class that was offered that if you signed up for the class, you were guaranteed to get an A in the course. This was at Florida State. They would outlaw this class t today. But this class did exist, and I took it. Because you know why? I had a horrible GPA, and I needed an A. <laughs> but I knew, sign up for that class, you get an A. The teacher gave very minimal requirements. It was a theater class. And... That really wasn't my interest. My interest was the A. The, the work in the class was, I can't really tell you much about it. You, I didn't go to class much. There, there really was no motivation to go to that class. No motivation to go to it. I got an A anyway. I mean, I'm done. I, I did go a couple times just because I felt like I should at least show up. But I, I got an A. I got an A in that class. but I had no motivation to go to class. No motivation to do the work to, for the class. What little there was. Let's take that to the spiritual realm just for a second. God does a work in your heart to justify you, to bring about saving faith in your heart, and it gives you eternal life he gives you eternal life on the moment you put your faith and trust in Christ. He gives you an A. You stand before him forgiven forever and ever and ever. But what is it, folks, that makes me want to follow Jesus after that happens, after that act of justification happens? What is it, folks, that opens my blind eyes to see the glory of God's gospel? What is it that makes me want to love Jesus more than my sin? What is it that wants me to, makes me want to desire to read this book on day two of that experience? What is it that makes me want to go to church? What is it that makes me want to be with God's people and turn from my sin what is it that does that? It's the work of God in me. That's called regeneration, friends. Regeneration. It precedes faith. You know why? Because I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. Because my heart is darkened in understanding. Because the natural man cannot understand the things of God. That is my condition until God does something in me to cause me to desire him. No man seeks after God, Romans 3 says. Everybody runs, is a, goes astray. What is it that makes me want to do these things? It's called regeneration. And folks, if you have not been regenerated, you have not been saved. Regeneration is not something you do. It is something God does in you to bring you to salvation. This is very important. I told you last week, this is a missing doctrine in the church today. People will say, oh yeah, I prayed that prayer. I became a Christian. They'll say, I became a Christian. I prayed that prayer. 
And day two, no desire to follow Christ. Day two, no desire to walk with Jesus. No desire to continue in his word. No desire to be with God's people. No desire to turn from sin. I would say to them, you prayed a prayer all right, but I don't think regeneration happened. Because you will know a tree by its fruit. That's what regeneration does. It gives me a desire to bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. I get a desire for that. I don't make that up. I don't just work that up myself. That's something the Spirit of God does. And you tell me you're a Christian and you have no desire for the things of God, no desire to follow Jesus, no desire to be with God's people, I would say you might want to go back and check that one out. Because regeneration is a work of God. That's not a work of man. If it was a work of man, I could understand the flaw of, of your performance. It's not works that save us. See, this is the Roman Catholic Church used to accuse Protestants of. You say everybody gets an A at the beginning. What's going to be the motivation for them not to just take, make, to go on sinning? Go on sinning. So they would say, you've got to tell people they've got to keep doing works until they die. See, they fail to understand. It's not works that save us, but it's works that give evidence that we are saved. And those works are produced by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit throughout my Christian life. So, it's... It, it's this doctrine that I want to take the next few minutes of our time just to give you some examples of because regeneration is the impartation of the divine nature into you and me as believers. We have become partakers of the divine nature. God lives in you if you're a Christian. Christ in you if you're a Christian. He lives in you. He, has, he lives in you by the work of regeneration. He took a residence in your heart. The temple of God is your heart. You are the temple of God in regeneration. So why, Jesus, why, why do you tell the disciples that it's impossible? Because it is impossible. This is not a work of man. This is a work of God. You don't do anything for this. There's no formula to get regenerated. Understand that. No formula to get regenerated. I'm sure that's causing some questions. Let's look at this. Let's go to this statement. It's the first act in salvation, in time, in time, in reality. It's the first act in your salvation, regeneration. Now, eternally, divine election is the first act in salvation. That's in eternity. In eternity past, God predestined, Ephesians tells us and other places tell us, God predestined, he chose you. If you're a Christian, he chose you before the foundation of the world. He put your name in a book. That's, that's in eternity past. Regeneration happens in reality, in time. Those who are chosen before the foundation of the world, God regenerates them. He regenerates you. If you were chosen before the foundation of the world and your name was put in a book, in time, some point in your life, God regenerates you. If you're a Christian, you were regenerated. You may not remember the day you were regenerated, but you were regenerated. Jesus became more important to you and your own sin, your own life, and the direction your life was going, because God did that. Let me show you some passages. Go to, let me just say this. The Bible does teach human responsibility. I've showed you that for the last month, those three examples. The Bible teaches human responsibility all over the place. I showed you that. In those three examples, those three scenes. Today I'm talking about the divine side of salvation. The, the, actually the most important side of salvation, the divine side. 
I can't resolve human responsibility and divine and what God does. I can't. I cannot. The Bible never tries to reconcile those two things. They are parallel truths. Man must believe and repent, but God does it all. God must do it. Let me show you. Go to John 1. These, I'm going to run through these. We'll be in the book of John. I won't go anywhere else, so it'll save you from having to do so much turning. But John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. In John chapter 1, 12, you have the human side of this, the human perspective on salvation. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. That is the human side. This is the divine side. Who were born, who were born, who were regenerated is the word, who were regenerated. And then he gives, and then he, and then he gives three negatives. You were born. You were, um, God imparted to you new life. The life of God in the soul of a man or a woman. How, how did they become children of God in verse 12? They became children of God by being born. By being birthed by God. God. Not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See that? The three negatives, it's not by blood, you, you, it's not by your heritage. See, the Jews thought just to be born a Jew meant you were in the kingdom of God. No. Not by blood heritage. It's not by the will of the flesh. It's not by some, uh, something you do, you did. It's not by the will of man. It's not something you willed. Very emphatic denials. It's not any of those three things. It's nothing you did, nothing you will, nothing you desire, nothing you wanted, nothing about you at all. Nothing. Something God did. Born, born from above. Born again. All these terms are the same. But it's something that God did. Did. Come on, think about it. You didn't have anything to do with your physical birth. Mom and dad got together, and a few years later, you figured it out. But you had nothing, nothing to do with that birth. It's something God did. He born you. He regenerated you so that you might receive him and become a child of God. Not of human will. You were born again. <laughs> you were born, listen to this, you were born again, then you exercise your will. You don't believe and then God regenerates you. No. The reason you believe is because God regenerates you first. Boy, get that one down. You are not, you do not have the capability to overcome all the obstacles of your heart, all the sinful desires of your heart, and the darkness of your own heart, and the selfishness of your own heart. You don't have the power to get rid of that. You don't have the power to say no to that and mean it. But God can overcome you. God can make you willing, willing. All right, let's look again. It originated with God. That's what the first thing I want you to go to John chapter 3. Very familiar account. You know this account. This is the born again passage. There was a man of the Pharisees, John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He, didn't wanna, he did not want to be 
exposed. So verse 2 tells us he came by night. He was a ruler of the Jews. You know, you don't want to be seen with Jesus if you're a ruler of the Jews. So he comes by night. Listen, he has an ache in his heart just like this rich young ruler did. He knows in spite of all his credentials as a ruler and teacher in Israel, he knew he did not have eternal life. He knew he was not in the kingdom of God. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. But he had an ache in his heart. That's why he comes to Jesus. Nobody can do these these signs that you do unless God is with him. See, something else is on his mind, though. He never really tells what's on his mind, but Jesus, who can read his mind, jumps right to the point. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is a religious man like the rich young ruler in Luke 18. This is a devout man like the rich young ruler. But Jesus identifies his need right away. You want to be in the kingdom of God, and you can't get in there. Your good works, your religious life is not going to get you into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly I truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so he goes right to the issue of this man's heart. He's called a teacher of Israel down in verse 10. And it's interesting, there's an article in front of the word teacher there, meaning the teacher. He was a main teacher in Israel. A main teacher in Israel. Unless one is born again, that means unless one is born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of God. This is a fact. Folks, this is not an imperative. He's not giving the man a command here. He's not telling the man to go do something here. He's just telling the man a fact. You want to see the kingdom of God, you've got to be born again. You want to see the kingdom of God, you've got to be born from above. God has to do something in your heart for you to be in the kingdom of God. That's all he's saying. If somebody puts out a track, how to be born again, and gives you steps to how to be born again, it's an unbiblical track. Because there are no steps to being born again. Even Nicodemus understands that. When Jesus uses an analogy, he's got an important purpose for using that analogy. Birth. Birth. I will tell you, he says, you must be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of God. He says it in verse 5. In verse 6, you must be born of the Spirit. You see that in verse 5 and 6? You must be born of the Spirit. The agency of this birth is the Spirit. The Spirit of God must do something. You will never... And I I guess the whole point is, the analogy is so important here because you cannot make any contribution to that. You don't make a contribution to birth when it's your birth. You don't make a contribution to that. It's from above. Verse 4 and 5. Verse 5, he says. Oh, verse 4 shows you Nicodemus understands what he's talking about. He's talking about a physical birth. What, what kind of birth are you talking about? How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? He understands what Jesus is saying here about birth. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, and this is important, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot see or cannot enter the kingdom of God. Some have thought, well, that must be baptism. That is not baptism. That is not baptism. The Old Testament text on the new birth says this. If you want to turn there or just mark it down to save us some time here, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Listen to this. This is the Old Testament passage on being born again. This is the Old Testament passage on the new birth. I will sprinkle clean water on you. When the Jews heard water, they meant purification. I will purify you. I will clean up you. You can't clean up you. I will clean you up. I will. And you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your your filthiness and from your idols. See that? I will do that. 
He's not saying you're going to do that. I'm going to do that. Moreover, I will give you, get this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will do this. I will do this. Don't you go out and try to do it. There's no steps on how to get this. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take out the heart of stone, and I'm going to give you a soft heart, heart of flesh. And get this, I will put my spirit, oh, get this, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Folks, I am not saved by keeping the law, but once I am saved, I sure have a desire to keep it. Because I got the Spirit in me that's the Holy Spirit that gives me holy desires. I don't keep it perfectly. No, no, it's due. But the point is, this is a work of God. This is the regeneration passage of the Old Testament. This is the born-again passage of the Old Testament. I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. I will cleanse you. I will wash you. I will put my Spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my ways. I, 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 God speaking. Not you. I will give them, Jeremiah 24, 7 says, I will give them a heart to know me. I will bring to life their deadness. So, Nicodemus knew he was missing something, and what Jesus says he needs is regeneration. You need regeneration. Folks, that may be you this morning. I got a meaningless Christian life, it's just nowhere. I go nowhere in it. I put my faith in Jesus, and I don't know what's going on with it. Maybe you were never regenerated. Maybe you just mouthed a prayer, believed some facts about the gospel. Maybe that's all you did. Maybe that's all you did. A lot of people in America do that. The church is filled with people who think they're believers, and they're not. They've, why? Because they've never been regenerated. They've never been changed from within. And they claim to be Christians, and they do not know Christ. They love their idols more than him. They've never turned and repented of their sin. And those illustrations we've seen. All those illustrations we saw in Luke 18, by the way, are only made possible by regeneration. The only way I can repent, the only way I can depend on Christ, the only way I can turn from my idols is with God doing a work in me. Well, here's the shocker of the whole thing. Here's the shocker of the whole thing. Verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. Who controls the wind? Nobody. It just does what it wants to do. It just goes here, goes there. Listen, all I see from the wind is the effects of it. I do not know where it goes. I do not know where it goes or where it's coming from or where it's going to come next. The wind blows. And so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I do not know when God is going to land His Spirit on one of His elect. I don't know when He's going to do that. But that person will come to Him when He does that. See, you have no control over who the Spirit gives life to. You have no control over that. You're dead, you need life. When you believe in total depravity, this to makes total sense. I'm totally depraved, I'm totally lost, I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. Unless God does something, I'm dead. The preacher can't control where the Spirit goes. He can't control it. He tries to. You know, he tries to play music that's real manipulative of your heart. I'm going to get the Spirit to land on these people. You can't control the Spirit. I can't give you steps on how to get the Spirit of God in terms of regeneration for salvation. I can't give you steps to that. How can these things be, Nicodemus says? Because he does not tell Nicodemus how to be born again. So you and I sit here and say, well, so Rod, what do we do? Just say, blow, wind, blow? What do we say? What do we do? This passage tells us. It really does. Go down to verse 14. I can tell someone, hey, you're, you're lost. 
and you're separated from God. I can tell a person that. That's biblical. I can tell a person they're dead in their trespasses and sins. But the only thing I can do is what you and I we need to do, and that's verse 14. We need to lift up the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Why? So that every, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. Do you hear what I just read? In the very same passage of being born again by the Spirit, there's nothing I can do to make that happen. He says, you, he says lift, lift up Jesus. Lift up Jesus. Make much of Jesus. Tell people they must believe in Jesus because that's what the Bible says they must do. My point is, I trust Jesus. I trust in the power of God's word. I trust in the power of God. God is in his word, and God uses his word to regenerate somebody. That's my point. God will use his word. Tell them, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, it's all this is in the same passage. Divine sovereignty Divine sovereignty and salvation, the first half of the passage. The second half is preach it. Preach, you must believe in Jesus. But recognize, folks, that I don't care how good your arguments are. I don't care how, how emotional you are in your presentation of this message. God must do the work. God must do the work. God must regenerate. And it's impossible for somebody to regenerate themselves and to change themselves on the inside. Just lift up Christ and call people to believe. Tell every Nicodemus you meet that you've got to be born again. You've got to cry out to God for salvation. You've got to cry out to God to grant you repentance. Grant you faith. See, God gives, me the, God gives me the faith in this regeneration. He gives me the repentance in this regeneration. Those are not things that are natural to my nature. If he doesn't do something in me, I will never believe and I will never repent. We call it, theologians call it monergistic regeneration. Mono meaning one Erg, a unit of work, meaning only one agent at work. It's a work of God alone. Only God does this. Monergistic regeneration. Only God does it. I make no contribution to it. Now, you will listen to the radio, and you will hear other preachers preach synergistic. They will say, it's man and God equally working. I don't believe that's biblical at all. I don't believe you can support that in Scripture at all doesn't even fit the birth analogy that Jesus uses. I make no contribution to this. It happens in a split second. God regenerates you, and then you believe. God regenerates you, and you repent. God regenerates you, and your eyes are open to see the glory of Christ and salvation. There's no people walking around that were regenerated on March 10th and are still, and still waiting to be saved on July 14th. You follow me? It's a split-second thing. You're regenerated, and if you're a Christian, you were regenerated, whether you believed anything I've said here in this message today or not. It did happen. This is exactly how it happened. You were regenerated to believe, that you might believe that you might see, that you might be able to turn to Christ. All right, I want to show you one more before we leave. Go to John 6, 37. John 6, 37. Did I still have you in John by any chance? Were we still in John? I, I never know where I'm moved you around to, but John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. <laughs> all the Father gives to me, all the Father's given to me in eternity past will come to me. 
all the Father has chosen before the foundation of the world will come to me. Folks, this is the biggest, greatest explanation on how Jesus says, I will build my church. Jesus is not sitting in heaven, looking over heaven, saying, I sure hope somebody believes in me. He's not doing that. I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build it. He does it by regeneration and bringing the elect to salvation. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. It's a sovereign work of God, guaranteeing that they will come to me. God will overcome their resistance, and they will come to me. And God will bring them to me. How do I know that? Verse 44, because no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day. There you go. There you go. This word, some of you may not like this. You may not like this. It's okay. It took me years of my Christian life to get my mind around what little I know and understand. So I understand the uncomfortableness of some of this. But let me just say this. This is a very strong word, draw. He will draw. It carries the idea of dragging an object. It carries the idea of hauling bricks. It's um, putting maximum exertion on something. It's a very compelling dragging. Paul was preaching in Philippi, and he, they, you remember the story, he, 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 he preached the gospel to the girl that was selling all the idols and stuff like that, and got, everybody, got the people mad, and they drug him into the marketplace. Drug him. Drug him. That's the same word, draw. Drug him into the marketplace. Acts 21, the, the um, excuse me, John 18, let's go there. John 18, the, drawing the sword. You don't have to turn there. Don't turn anywhere. <laughs> John 18, he drew the sword. Same word. He drew the sword. Ready for action. Ready for action. John 21, 6. 153 fish in a net, drawing, dragging that net. So I'm going to say to you this. This is power grace. <laughs> this drawing. This drawing is power grace. Folks, this grace, this grace is irresistible. It's irresistible. Oh, you say, no, I'm going to resist it. Well, not if you're one of his. You're not going to resist it. It's not resistible. You can't resist it. <laughs> Once God regenerates you, you can't resist it. Folks, this is God we're talking about. It's not me trying to make you do something. It's God. He drags you. I don't think he drags you kicking and screaming. It's not that picture. He recognizes there are things about you and me to overcome, no doubt. But it's, he makes me willing to come. You follow me? He makes me willing and desiring to come. I hope you get your mind around that thought. I once hated him, and now I love him. I once wanted to go my own way, and now I want to go this way. Who did that in me? I don't have the power to change me. He drags us. <laughs> he drags us. And we respond to his call. Because Romans 8, 29, those he predestined and chose, they're going to be glorified. It's a chain link here. You can't break the link. You can't break the link. If you were chosen, you're going to be glorified in the end. And in the middle there somewhere, you're going to get regenerated. He took out the heart of stone and he put in a heart of flesh and gave me a desire to come and to come running. So, Spurgeon says, he makes you willing. He makes you willing. He makes you willing. 
our message doesn't have to be perfect when we present the gospel to somebody because God's going to do the work. God is going to do the work. I may not get it all out just exactly right, but God's going to do the work. I rest in that. I rest in that. I know when I preach this sermon on Sundays, I know God's in his words, and I know God will do the work. I don't have to manipulate anybody to do something or believe something. I know God will do the work. This takes tremendous pressure off of you and I. All we're to do is to present the words. Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him. All of those things are valid things to say. That's the human side of it. But understand, as Jesus understood, a man, it's impossible for a man to be saved unless God does it. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. It's overwhelming to us, God, the greatness of this truth that we have looked at this morning. This rich young ruler demonstrated to us the impossibility because he could not get over himself. Only you can do that. In Jesus' name, amen.